All right. Ooh, we're live. Okay, we're gonna get going in a second here. Thank you, Anna. Fantastic talk as always from Anna. Hopefully you guys caught that. If not, you can see it afterwards. Um, talks in this room are being recorded and hopefully put up on YouTube. Um, so you definitely should check that out. All right, so we're gonna get rolling. Uh, my name's Mark Nonakoven. Um, I have a really interesting role um, in that I work for Trend Micro, I'm the VP of uh, Cloud Research, and I get to look at sort of the forward-looking what's coming in three to five years in cloud, um, but lately in the last year and a half, I've also been looking at operational technologies. Um, so I'm gonna define that for you, um, and it's this interesting sort of confluence of worlds. Um, but first, unlike Anna, I do not legally uh, have to give you a disclaimer. Um, apparently my legal team doesn't care about me, they will just hang me out to dry. Um, but I do wanna give you guys a bit of a warning because there's some uncomfortable stuff in this talk, and I think that's a good thing, I think we need to tackle it head on, um, but you may feel like doing this. That's okay, this is a safe space for us, okay? If you need to curl up in a ball to feel better about some of the things we're gonna tackle, that is absolutely fine. We're gonna try to be more scientific, more data-driven, more practical, looking at some of these challenges, okay? Because I think that is a very good thing to remember, is that it is computer science, it's not computer guessing, right? We are need to drive more of this data-driven approach into security. So with that, that's the warning. I wanna give you a couple definitions, and I know that's boring and everybody hates definitions, but it's absolutely critical that we're talking about the same types of things. And if Anna can get away with reading a 24-word name of a document, I think I can take a couple minutes to give you guys some definitions. So first of all, operational technology. What the heck is this? This is a technology that's really crept up on us in the world. It's in play in this building right now. There is operational technology running the um, heating and cooling system, right? You can hear it somewhat if you can get past the echo. Um, there is uh, operational technology running the escalators, running the elevators, it's running the um, power systems, it's running the traffic lights, it's running your hospitals, it's everywhere. It's in factories, it's autonomous vehicles, it's basically all this technology that's actually doing stuff in the real world. So you can think of it this way, IT, information technology, this is what we're used to, this is what we handle all the time. We know how well we can secure this stuff, right? At least I got one laugh there. Okay, we may have to just stop this talk and talk about how well we think we're doing in information security right now. Um, but yeah, thank you, Steve, there we go. Um, so there's significant challenges around uh, information technology and securing that, right? Cybersecurity, we are still working at it. We are not great at it in the general sense. So think of all those challenges and then add real world consequences. Oops, sorry, hold on. Add real world consequences. That is operational technology. So all of the lovely problems that we have in IT, we're gonna take those and we're gonna move them and we're gonna attach things in the real world to all of these IT challenges. Now you're starting to figure out why I put the little girl in the fetal position, because there's a lot of uncomfortable things that are gonna be coming up here. Okay, so that in general is operational technology. The next definition I wanna give you, just to make sure, because hopefully you read the title of this talk, is actually paradox. So paradox is a situation, um, a person or a thing that combines contradictory features or qualities. I know, horrible, right? This also contains my all-time favorite dictionary definition example. This pops up in Google, and for the botanists in the crowd, this is hilarious. For the rest of us, you will just have the same reaction I do. The mingling of deciduous trees with elements of desert flora forms a fascinating ecological paradox. It is fascinating, isn't it? I have no idea why that's the example. The example I would give is this one starting a good talk with a dictionary definition, or uh, dictionary quote, is an intriguing conference paradox. Hopefully, it is the case. Hopefully, this is still a decent talk, even though I did the one thing I promised myself I would never do professionally. Last thing I wanna give you is my definition of cybersecurity. Now, this may be controversial, this may run counter to what you think cybersecurity is, but the goal of cybersecurity is very, very simple. It's not the CIA triad, though that's part of it. It's not stopping hackers, though that's part of it. It's not um, preventing malware or system exploits, though that is part of it. It's very simply put, make sure that your systems work as intended and only as intended. It may seem like it's splitting hairs, but this definition requires you to play as a team. 
requires you to work with the rest of your business to ensure that whatever you're building does what you want it to and only that. Okay? Very different definition, but I think this one is far more productive than how most of us view this. So with those out of the way, I want to give you our problem statement that we're going to tackle today. So the problem is this contrast between IT and OT. Okay, when we are defending IT, we have a pretty uh, solid framework where we start. Yes, we make a lot of mistakes. Yes, we have challenges, but we understand some of the basics. Let's say we have a website that's selling widgets or it's selling um, anything you can think of. We're an e-commerce website. We're the Amazon.ca. And again, I don't have my legal team, so when I give quotes like that, I'm sure I'll still get sued. But we have the site and we're running, uh, you know, we're taking money and this is our business. And we're making, let's say we're not great at it, we're making a million a year. We know when we go to defend this, we're gonna look for um, defenses that cost less than a million dollars, right? We call that the ALE. This is, should not be an unfamiliar term. It's not this one, it's this one, annual loss expectancy. This is the I, uh, C CISSP 101. Annual loss expectancy is how much you expect to lose and how many times a year you expect to lose it. So if your website goes down or is hacked and it costs, uh, you're making $10,000 an hour and you expect that to happen 10 times over the course of a year, that's $100,000. So from a business decision, you're gonna look at that and say, well, if it's gonna cost me a million dollars to prevent $100,000 in loss, that's ridiculous, I'm gonna take the loss. But if it only costs you $10,000 to present, uh, prevent that, you're up $90,000, right? That's pretty straightforward. Everyone agree to that? Yeah? Good, I got some nodding. Everyone's like, oh crap, what's coming next? Well, I'm sorry, oh crap is coming. So when we look at operational technology, we're talking about the robots that build our car chassis. So now when we're trying to defend the robots that are welding these chassis together, what's the value of protecting that? These are built to very specific safety standards. They're highly regulated within Canada and most countries. Um, if there's an error introduced into these and your chassis folds on impact when it's not supposed to, causing harm or death, and you could have prevented that up the chain because you had a known risk that you didn't mitigate, what's that worth? How's the math work out on that? I love how it's dead silent. Everyone's like, crap, this got dark fast. It does. Same thing with a plane wing, okay? Plane wing, these things are built to obviously to withstand stress in flight. Uh, any sort of error in the build of this wing, even something as small as two millimeters off on a join will cause catastrophic failure. Yay. Again, how's the math work out on this? What about robot vehicles, right? Autonomous vehicles, same kind of thing. You look at the um, uh, current question around ethics or challenges in programming them. Should a robot vehicle kill its passengers and driver to save a busload of kids? What's the ethics on that? How do you build that in from a cybersecurity risk model? How do you deal with questions like this? Healthcare. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry, this gets happier. I promise this will get happier in a minute. From a healthcare perspective, your MRI machines, right? The imaging is absolutely critical in healthcare delivery. What if there is an issue with that from a quality issue or your machine is hacked and it's returning either a false positive or a false negative? It says you have cancer, you don't. It says you don't have cancer, you do. This is a completely different equation than the very simple math, I'm losing $100,000 a year, I can spend 10,000 to prevent it. Different stakes entirely when it comes to operational technology. So the general tendency, especially as, as builders, as technologists, is to push for zero risk tolerance here. We have no appetite for risk when we're dealing with these technologies. That's our default push. That's where we wanna go. That's an admirable aim. There's no way in hell that's ever gonna happen. That's still with the uncomfortable part. That's not the happy part. The reality is when we're dealing with the abstract ideas of building out these technologies, we have this wonderful bubble of how everything works. The easy way to understand this is when you're designing a, a system for your organization, everything's an ideal scenario, 
right? And you may get a little dark and go, well, there's a single point of failure here. I'd like to eliminate that by adding in some redundancies. But as soon as you pull this stuff into the real world and the operational technologies are all about the real world, things get messy. None of these abstract ideas really pan out, okay? So that's the setup. I wanna give you the paradox, and like any good paradox, it's a temporal paradox. Because really, there's no other good kind of paradox. So you might be familiar with temporal paradoxes maybe from this movie, which apparently is part of a trilogy. The third one is coming out soon, they're filming it now. Yeah, a lot of questions around that one. Still, interesting, they travel back in time, and no impact whatsoever on the future, pull out all of these historical figures to San Dimas for a book report. Lots of questions. Maybe your temporal paradox understanding comes from Groundhog Day, one of my all-time favorites. Or from the Terminator series, a series that only has two movies. I think we can all agree there are only two movies in the Terminator series. We're all better off just ignoring what happened after number two. When it comes to operational technology, the temporal paradox is really the life cycle of the systems we're dealing with. Average uh, freight vehicle uh, runs for about nine to 10 years. Over the course of that lifespan, it will drive a million miles on the road. When we talk about factories, um, ICS and SCADA equipment in a factory, average lifespan of this stuff is 14 years. If we look at robotic arms, which are used in manufacturing and a number of other scenarios, average lifespan is eight years. Healthcare, if we look at MRI specifically, average lifespan of this equipment is 11 years. Let's contrast that to the IT world that we're used to. We see, on average, a new vulnerability specific to operational technology, so specific to one of these categories, every three days. If we look at malware, and this is the general case for malware, we see new malware generated every 0.3 seconds. Do you notice a discrepancy between the timelines here? Right, one is dealing on years, if not decades. The other, we're lucky if it stays at one every three days. So this is the challenge, and I'm gonna go through uh, some specific examples to highlight some of the challenges and some of the issues that we've seen as we uh, dive into this type of research in this area. So we'll start with vehicles. Remember vehicles, nine year uh, lifespan on average, um, and we're talking autonomous vehicles now, right? So we've seen that start to come into the commercial side. We've seen features in higher end sedans and things like the Teslas where they can park themselves. Um, we've seen where they can drive themselves. There's legal questions around it. Um, Anna would be better off than I to answer those. Um, but interestingly enough, you know, we're further along than you expect. Now, when I say robot vehicles, most people expect this kind of robot. Unfortunately, it's not this kind of robot, um, though that would be amazingly cool. But again, still the same problem because there's no way you're rebuilding this guy every year. Today, in the States, wow, that was powerful. Today in the States. Um, today in the States, Uber has a fleet of self-driving trucks that are delivering freight. There are other companies that are very close. Um, believe it or not, self-driving freight is actually a far easier problem to solve than uh, normal vehicles. Because freight uh, has limited access into cities, it's almost all highway driving. Way easier computer science problem to tackle. Um, that was this year in 2014 that actually the testing started. The reason I love this article, um, as much as I love popular science, this is a horrible geek sub-headline. Optimus Prime came home and got a day job. He's always had a job. He's saving the universe and humanity. Come on. But we've been pushing this for this for a while. Um, now, on a vehicle, there's a number of devices that need to talk to each other, right? They don't just exist. You don't just say, this is a robot vehicle now. Um, even in your dumb vehicle, there are devices that need to speak to each other. And these all speak over a system called the CAN bus, right? The controller area network. Very logical, makes perfect sense. There needs to be a network inside your car, how different devices um, speak to each other. Well, this stand, div, um, network was actually set in 1986 was when it was designed. This is an international standard. Every single vehicle in this city has this bus running inside of it. Um, in North America, that is true. Um, uh, all the EU vehicles and a lot of Asian vehicles are using this one as well. And um, there is a new standard on the books now, but as we know from the life cycle, it takes a really long time. As a reminder, for those of you who weren't around in 1986, um, this is the state-of-the-art cell phone from 1986. 
This is also state-of-the-art fashion from 1986 and how all portrait photography was pretty much done with that inset shadow boxing. Um, this phone, by the way, cost about $6,000 in uh, today's uh, 19 or 2018 equivalent. Um, it made phone calls. Point for now. Sometimes. Okay? This was when we designed the underlying network that's running in our vehicles now. So you think about all these different devices. We've got our anti-lock braking system, we've got our GPS, we've got the dashboard, we've got safety systems, the engine itself, all of them talk to each other over this bus designed in 1986. And it was designed in a very logical way. There's nothing wrong with the way they uh, solved that problem in the day. It, there are very real electrical engineering constraints here. This is a more detailed look at that bus. You can see um, C and B on the top. There's no differentiation between the two, uh, but they all bridge through the um, computer uh, body computer module and the ODB2 port. So the port you may have been uh, familiar with, some insurance companies will give you a little device to plug in. Um, in the States, you can actually get some cool apps um, that you can plug into the, the a physical component of the part to read your car on your smartphone. If you're curious, about 25 bucks on Amazon.ca will get you an ODP, uh, T, uh, ODB2 um, diagnostic reader. It's the same thing your mechanic uses anytime there's a dash error, right? They just plug it in and go. But you'll notice here we've got a number of modules on this bus. And the interesting thing is that the way this bus works, if the anti-lock braking system wants to uh, tell the car something, it will send a message out on the bus. And every single component on the bus will read that message. It's a broadcast network. Right? They all get this message and then they choose whether or not to react to it. Limits of the technology at the time. Um, and what happens is if something, if there's an error state here, if somebody gets a little too chatty and sends too many messages onto the bus in too quick a time span, the other modules will ignore it. They will basically be like that chatty person who's you know, on the bus who's trying to chat you up the whole time and you're like, okay, no. You just ignore it, that's the exact same thing that happens on a vehicle. Now, if we put on our bad guy hats, what we can do is if we have access to this bus, we can put out a lot of messages in a very fast uh, period, of, in a very short period of time to cause other devices to ignore a device that we choose. We can pretend to be the anti-lock braking system and make the rest of the vehicle ignore us. Now the good news here, and there is good news, so I can get some smiles or some nods back, is that almost every single one of these modules fails in a safe way. Physical safety is an absolute priority in a car. So just because the anti-lock braking system is, sta is talking to the uh, rest of the systems and they are ignoring it, doesn't mean that they go, oh yeah, we're going 100 mile an hour now, right? It's just that some additional functionality will not work. So if you think of um, something like your uh, in-car entertainment system and display, it will no longer update information from the ABS system because it's ignoring it. Now, a few things that you might have noticed from this attack. Um, there's no authentication on this bus at all. It's a complete trust environment. Yay. It's a wonderful world if we could live in a complete trust environment. It's also no segmentation. There is no differentiation on the way these systems are connected between safety systems and comfort systems. It treats your power window the same as it does egg, uh, fuel intake. That's a problem. Those are two very different things when it comes to uh, the car's functionality. Now you might think, okay, I need physical access. Well, if you've seen an ad in the last year, you will know that one of the top features in automobiles in 2017 and 2018 models is a Wi-Fi hotspot that's LTE connected. Guess what the only thing defending the rest of your car is? Is that infotainment Wi-Fi hotspot. Cybersecurity is not a priority, yet we've taken something very critical and connected it to the outside world. Now your car is constantly connected, and that's for our vehicles. Autonomous vehicles are always connected. And while they may have a fancy layer that has cybersecurity taken into account, underneath it is still this very old, very vulnerable CAN bus system. Another example is factories. So again, as a reminder, average lifespan of uh, pieces of technology within the factory about 14 years. Most people will think factories, this kind of thing. Um, there's a human here putting on the actual sealant caps on the wine bottles. It's cheaper and easier to get a human to do it than a robot. 
um, which is an interesting case when you start to dive into factories, is where humans are more effective or at least cheaper rather than robots themselves. Um, manufacturing is the number two attack vertical. 94% of those attacks are espionage related. Not nation state espionage, corporate espionage. Because it turns out, if I want to steal your secret formula, it's far easier for me to attack your factory where that formula is in use and put that into uh, a piece of IP back together rather than attack your secure corporate network where it's stored in a database and where you're looking. So we see a huge amount of attacks here, a lot of it corporate espionage. To put that in context, 17% uh, of the US GDP comes from manufacturing. There's a huge amount of money to be had in this area. Now a factory, we saw a little intro video there of a human working on a factory. The reality is humans are working side by side with different types of technology and robots on the factory floor. Um, so you get this factory, there's uh, people, there's technology, and it's connected into an operational network on site. Because now we have a lot of data that's coming up from all these multiple lines. So we've got multiple lines, every component on the line is generating data and you have this uh, a challenge around managing it. Can you optimize the flow of your factory because that's how you're making money? Well, of course, that's just too much information to handle on site. So we don't just connect the factory uh, to itself, we connect it back to the corporate network. Because now we have data analysts and programmers running in our corporate network who are uh, sending information uh, out to the factories to adjust production. Um, they have chains of factories where your supply chain is in play. And of course, you know, this just keeps scaling up and up and up. You have more than one factory, you're around the world, and there's a lot of interconnectivity. The challenge, as you've probably already spotted, is that you're taking an operational network and connecting it back to your corporate network. But all of our corporate networks are super secure, right? Yeah, okay, that's, you could have at least chuckled. Not at all the case. So when we did, at Trend Micro Research, we did a study on factories and robots, and uh, here you're seeing um, a heat map on how many uh, factory floors we found directly exposed out to the internet. Um, the dots will come into play in the next section for robots. Uh, but there's a huge amount of these stuff that's directly connected, let alone correct, connected through their corporate network. Um, to make matters worse, 13% success rate for phishing attacks in the manufacturing sector. 13%. And you know that the corporate network, if we're sitting in a cubicle somewhere, is connected to the factory and to the operational technology. Now, most of this stuff is behind SCADA and ICS. Um, so uh, these are what's running the HVAC here, the traffic lights, all that. I need you guys to prepare yourself for the sexiest technology shot you've ever seen. You guys ready? This is a typical SCADA or ICS system. Look at that box. It is just bland as all hell, right? But an immense amount of technology behind here. This is the solution uh, that we have taken over the last 30 years to automate a lot of this physical technologies. We attach an intelligent controller to it, and then we're adding technology into the controller because the thing that's actually doing physical manipulation doesn't need to change that much. It's doing its job. Well, we just need to connect it up so that we can uh, access it remotely, we can program it remotely, we can pull the status off of it. Well, it turns out that we've been tracking this stuff quite long, uh, quite a while. This is um, from ICS CERT in the States. They track vulnerabilities associated with SCADA and ICS equipment, as well as another, uh, a number of other operational technologies. You'll notice there is a slight increase in this chart. This is such a significant increase in 2016. So we start in 2010, we move our way over to 2016. This is such a massive increase that in this report, they felt the need to put a disclaimer that they felt justified that this was an anomaly in reported vulnerabilities. Now, being a group of cybersecurity professionals, I think you'll find the irony in what they felt as an anomaly. The anomaly was a couple of security researchers pointed some modern fuzzing tools at some uh, standard ICS equipment and they found an additional 16 or 1700 vulnerabilities just in two or three samples. So this is someone from our community finally pointing our modern testing tools at this type of operational technology and they found a couple issues to say the least, right? This is not an anomaly, this is the start of the new normal when it comes to operational technology because it's never been prepared for cybersecurity risk. It's been built around physical safety and physical risk, as it should be, but now it's being connected out into a world that is completely unprepared for. 
right? This is where we come into our uh, paradox coming back into time. This stuff is living for 14 years. If you think it's really hard to patch a desktop system or a laptop, try to patch a gray box on a factory floor, right? They're not even built to accept these types of updates. Huge challenge coming up in this area. And it's only getting worse. So we have these strong physical safety standards. There are some proposals globally to add cybersecurity standards into this, but not nearly enough um, to make a difference. And we need to start working now because this stuff is on such a long replacement cycle. If we don't set strong standards now for it, it's going to be decades and decades before we actually have this stuff in place. The extreme measure is when you look at like chip fab. So Intel uh, for the last five or six years has run nearly completely autonomous factories. They have no people in their factories other than basic sort of, hey, we need a human here because that makes us feel better. Um, the factories actually talk to each other to um, uh, talk about uh, silicone um, output on the uh, chips um, and on the wafers. So moving upstream, they can complain, uh, com uh, coordinate the entire supply chain completely hands off. But again, as advanced as that technology is, a lot of it is underpinned by SCADA and ICS systems where we know just one research team pointing some basic tools at found uh, hundreds and hundreds of vulnerabilities. So here we've got hostile networks because we know the factory floor, which is not a secure network in any way, shape, or form, uh, but is connected to a hostile corporate network. And I think it's safe to assume that every corporate network on the planet is hostile at this point. Again, that ties back to how good a job are we doing. Um, and then we know that there is a massive amount of unknown vulnerabilities out there because nobody's been testing these devices for cybersecurity vulnerabilities. They've been more worried about physical safety. So there's some significant challenges here. Next example I wanna give you is robotic arm. So a reminder, these are about an eight year life cycle. Um, robotic arm, very much like our arm, three points of articulation, shoulder, elbow, wrist, only unlike our arm that tends to have uh, only one position of power, um, they are fully strong throughout all points of articulation, extremely versatile. You can see here, there's a number of tiny arms with different effectors or hands. Um, there's ones with drills, there's the little suction cup guy that comes up and puts the, the plate on, and then other little arms that do drills. Another common example where you'll see these is in auto ads, when they show you the factory floor and they're holding up a chassis, that's the big size of these arms. Uh, in independent, they look like this, so very much like an arm, they're well named. Uh, very cool piece of technology, but they do come in all shapes and sizes. So the smallest come about six pounds is their maximum uh, pull. They do about a 19 inch reach all the way up to the big, big ones that are just shy of two tons with almost a 14 foot reach. Those are the ones that you see holding up the car, right? They are used in manufacturing. Um, they are used um, in laboratories. Uh, they are used in any number of scenarios where an arm would be useful. As people who have arms, you have a long track record of knowing when arms are useful. You can imagine how, if you could replace that with robots, where the upside is. Back to the map. All the dots you see are occurrences of these arms directly connected to the internet. Not connected to a factory, network that's connected to the internet or a factory network that's connected to a corporate network that's connected to the internet, literally hit the IP and query the robotic arm remotely. Not a good thing, not a good thing at all. So robots themselves are uh, come under a category called uh, cyber physical systems. I hate this word, I hate this phrase. The only reason I put this is because it gives me an excuse to put up a Locutus of Board icon, uh, which I find cool. But it reminds, uh, the, the term cyber physical or robot and human is a reminder of how these things were built. They are built to work right beside people on the factory floor. So physical safety has been the number one concern. But this is a typical deployment of a robotic arm. So you can see here we've got the arm at the top with a different uh, hand or an effector on it. It has a controller that by default is connected to two different places. The robot network itself where there's normally a system or what's called a teach pendant to work with the robot and manipulate the robot directly, as well as a programmer network. Now you'll notice most of the time, this is remotely connected over a mobile connection, right? This is going from GPRS into LTE finally and pushing into 5G, but by default, this is a device that's connected to two different networks. Off the bat, you can imagine where we're going with this and I will not disappoint you. We are going full into dumpster fire train wreck ter territory here. So some problems that we found when we were working on the initial research here. Uh, poor to little or no encryption. 
outdated software, like 10-year-old vulnerable known issue software embedded into these systems. Poor or no authentication. Um, everybody's favorite authentication in place with default passwords, right? Uh, insecure interfaces. In other words, you can just walk up and plug a USB into it, or it's running a number of services on the network that it doesn't actually need to. And one that I'm going to dive into as an example is code signing. Now, I'm not going to go into the deep version of code signing in that these will take firmware updates that are not signed um, and programs that are not signed. That's a whole other bad issue. I'm going to show you a very simple example, and I'm going to actually show you an attack on these. This is where we're running into a challenge. This is all, is anyone surprised by this list? This is Security 101, right? This is App Security 101, but we find every single textbook example in this technology that is running most or building most of the components that the modern world uses because they haven't looked at cybersecurity as a risk before. So here's an example. This is a layout of an attack that I'm going to show you on video real quick. Um, every one of these robots has two components to run from a software perspective. It's got a program, so where the arm should move, and a configuration file that tells the robot what it believes to be true about the world. So the reason these are separated is pretty straightforward. If I'm running in a factory and I have three different lines, and one of those lines happens to be two feet higher than the other just based on the, the way the building is laid out, I can change the config file to keep the same program. So I can tell the one robot that's higher than the others, hey, you're higher than the others. Here's how you have to adjust what you know to be true about the world. Well, it turns out that there is absolutely zero signing and zero verification of the configuration file. The robot will just take it blindly from an FTP on the network. That's the default. We didn't even change that. By default, it will, ran, it will grab a file off an FTP site and use it to execute a program. So here's an example. Um, this is actually a video of an attack. So we've got a little uh, robot arm uh, in the lab. And we set the program to draw a straight line. Super exciting, I know. But it's going to draw a straight line on an iPad. Now, this is the same program, very simple program, right? Move, wait, turn around, move back. Um, this is the same type of program where you would have the robot welding, OK? Or sealing and package, something on this. So the pencil trail is relatively straight. And um, this has to do with the resolution of the iPad, not the program on the uh, robot. But that's basically a straight line. So that would be a solid weld. That would be a good um, outcome from the robot. Now we change the configuration file. So not the program. We just change the configuration file. We don't hack anything. We literally change a text file. And what ends up happening now, so you can see here, here's the program code. No differences. Um, now what happens is when you look at the line that the robot drew, it doesn't seem to be too much of a difference until you see the tail end of it. And what we've been able to do without hacking anything, you can see a bit of it there, and it's coming back now, is we've introduced a two millimeter defect with only changing a text file, no hacking involved. Remember in the intro when I gave the example of like the plane wing or the car chassis? Two millimeter is a catastrophic defect. It's also a defect that's very difficult to detect because people aren't generally looking for it at this point, right? So we can introduce this with just changing a text file. Issues we're seeing here, these devices are exposed. They're connected where they should not be. This is obviously a challenge. Um, there are known vulnerabilities. So this isn't even like the um, last scenario uh, where we know that there's a bunch of stuff we don't know. And I hate to sound like some of the folks who have been there before. But um, with the ICS cert, we saw that massive spike in, in vulnerabilities because we pointed one tool at some known stuff. This one we know. We know that a 10-year-old library has vulnerabilities and we can iterate the vulnerabilities. Last example I'm going to give you is healthcare. Again, reminder, 11-year life cycle for most MRI machines and other similar imaging equipment. Somebody had to say it today. Uh, WannaCry, everybody remembers this. It hit major headlines. Um, not a very effective ransomware, but a very effective attack. Where it was probably most impactful was in the National Health Service uh, in the UK. They are very similarly set up to us. Um, they have what they call trusts, which, you, which uh, the equivalent here in Canada is basically your local hospital with multiple campuses. A number of trusts during WannaCry shut down services. They were unable to deliver frontline services. Anything except utter emergencies were turned away because their normal systems, patient intake, things like that, were all uh, infected with WannaCry. Well, obviously, this was a big enough issue that the National Audit Service did an official report to Parliament in the UK on it. And one of the things they called out was the fact that several of their imaging systems, including MRI scanners, 
were impacted and had to be taken offline because of this ransomware, because of WannaCry. So you think about that for a second. Because of a ransomware attacking Windows systems out on the net and propagating very, very quickly, here is a healthcare delivery network that has to take services offline and a critical patient care tool because it's been hit by ransomware. It's not a good situation. Now, you're gonna cringe, and I'm sorry, so make sure you have enough space to grab the table appropriately because you're gonna have to do the head smash. The reason why this impacted so many machines was there's two ways that MRIs uh, end up working, and they work as a unit. They're sold as a unit from the manufacturer. The actual MRI device itself, so the actual big uh, magnetic drum and scanner that the patient goes in, and the diagnostic imaging workstation. They are sold as a complete set. IT tends to treat them as a lab, piece of lab equipment. The manufacturer treats them as a combined piece of equipment, but obviously the operator system is just like any other endpoint on your network. It's running some version of our operating system. It needs to be care, you need to care and maintain it just like you would for any other desktop. Well, the bad part here, and uh, you know, I'm sorry, but this is a reality. The MRI machines in the NHS were running Windows XP embedded. And I'll say that again just so that you, I'm not making a mistake. Windows XP embedded. Okay? Again, that life cycle, 11 year life cycle. When they bought it, it was only a couple years old. Right? There was no, like, oh, this is a horrendously out of date system. The operating systems are running either Windows XP or Windows 7. No vulnerabilities there, right? And again, they don't even have the normal endpoint type protection that we would deploy because they're treated as a closed black box. Example of that mismatch of time. Another healthcare example, this is a scary one. There, last year, there was a recall of pacemakers. First time I've ever seen it, a firmware update was required. This is the first firmware update instruction set I've ever seen that said you need a crash cart next to you when you perform this update. Because there is a chance that when you update this, you are gonna brick the pacemaker and your patient could go act into a cardiac event. That's not your normal Patch Tuesday, right? This is significant. This was uh, uh, about 400,000 plus pacemakers. Um, to give you an idea, patient has device directly connected to heart, right? Electricity pumping into heart, regulating their cardiac um, uh, rate. Um, doctor can control it. The idea behind the pacemaker was a noble one. Instead of putting a port on the surface for the patient that has the risk of infection um, and any other complications, um, they had an RF way of updating the pacemaker, right? So they would be able, within 10 feet, to put, uh, update the um, tuning on the pacemaker to ensure a better outcome for the patient. So literally, they provided remote access to somebody's heart. No surprise, they messed it up. The protocol really didn't have any authentication into it, um, and it was not very hard to reverse. So somebody could come by, as long as they were within 10 feet of you, within three meters, they could adjust your pacemaker settings. All sorts of maliciousness there, right? So here we've got exposed devices again, whether it's through RF, or whether it's being connected to networks that they shouldn't be, and known vulnerabilities. Windows XP has not been supported in forever. Um, we need to get rid of it, but again, it's treated like a black box system. So where do we go from here? I think the underlying theme and the reason why I wanted to give this talk was that all of this operational technology has been built with best intentions in mind. It's been built around physical safety, physical security. Regulations are very much focused on the physical world as they should have been. However, we've gone out of our way to make them smart and to connect them into our world of cybersecurity and cyber safety. They are horrendously unprepared for the world they find themselves in now. We saw through each example a number of common mistakes, right? They're connected to broadcast networks, no internal defenses, vulnerabilities left, right, and center. Um, all of these issues are easily tackleable for mitigating now, and we need to adjust the standards to fix them permanently, right? But we need to treat them like the devices they are. They are actual endpoints, but nobody sees them like endpoints, because when was the last time you talked to building maintenance about the security of the heating and cooling system? Almost nobody talks about this, right? This is not a world that we're in there. We have an opportunity to go in to educate, to help people along, because the good news is when we were working with um, the, doing the robotics research, we worked with ABB, they were a robotics manufacturer, 
they were absolutely over the moon that somebody was helping them along with this. And during the course of the research, they did a number of firmware updates that addressed a lot of this. So there's opportunity here, but there is this massive, massive mismatch. So we need to understand that because if you're building a web server, you can tear it down and spin a new one up. When you build a truck, you're not gonna wanna toss that aside and build a new one if you made a mistake. So patch and move forward is not the way forward here. We need to think a little bit more ahead of time. Yes, patching's part of it, but we need to make sure that we're covering our basis and uh, evaluating the risk ahead of time as we're building these devices. So remember, goal of cybersecurity, very much as it extends into operational technology as well, is to make sure that whatever you're building works as intended and only as intended. I want my pacemaker, if I had one, to regulate my heartbeat. I don't want it to be hackable by anybody in the front three rows. That's not what the intention is, right? This is our goal, we need to stick to it. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, references to all the research papers and some other um, research uh, outside at this link. I'll tweet it out shortly. Um, very quickly, uh, just thank you. Some of this research was done uh, from uh, my research teams, as well as um, High Trust and Politecnico de Milano, they're at University of Milan. Uh, fantastic uh, experience working with both those organizations. Again, um, thank you very much. We're running short on time, so I'll take some questions up here. Um, uh, and you can hit me up online at MarkNCA anytime, and I'll be around uh, for the rest of the show as well. Thank you very much.